move on to our next speaker who's going to focus on hepatitis C genotype 3, and that's Dr. Michael Freed, who comes to us from the University of North Carolina at the UNC Liver Center, where he's Professor of Medicine and Director of Hepatology. And Mike is going to share with us a, a case related to genotype 3 in a cirrhotic patient. Mike? Well, thanks very much, and I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank you to the organizing committee. And I think uh, we recognize that treating genotype 3 in patients with cirrhosis can be particularly challenging. Fortunately, we have some options that can help us these days. Uh, here are my disclosures. So this is a case, a uh, 54-year-old uh, white male with genotype 3A who actually first found out that he probably had hepatitis C back in 1989 uh, when he was refused as a blood donor because he had abnormal liver tests. Uh, but he didn't have the diagnosis of hepatitis C made until 1998 when he was actually tested for hepatitis C. And in 1999, he received interferon and ribavirin and had a partial response. So his HCV RNA dropped a little bit, but it never disappeared during the course of therapy, if you remember those, those old days with interferon-based treatments. Uh, in 2002, he was retreated with PEG interferon and ribavirin, and his treatment was discontinued at 12 weeks. Uh, he had irritability. He had, had to take time off from work, so he's having a difficult time with, with PEG interferon. His HCV RNA levels had just, again, dropped somewhat, but had not um, uh, become negative, and treatment was discontinued early. He came to see us for the first time in 2013, and he was complaining of significant uh, progressive fatigue that he had noticed over the last few years. On exam, he had some spider angioma. He had palmar erythema. Uh, no hepatosplenomegaly, but his laboratory data was somewhat concerning. His hemoglobin was 15 grams. His platelet count now is 110,000. ALT was 86. His total ability was normal. Albion was, was good. His fibrosure was consistent with F4 disease. And again, this is back in 2013. We still didn't have a, a fibro scan in the U.S. yet. His hepatic ultrasound, though, suggested cirrhosis with a nodular contour, and he did not have any uh, liver masses. So clearly, he had evidence of progression of his disease uh, from the time he, he first presented uh, 10 to 12 years ago. So which statement do you most agree? Genotype 3 is uncommon and therefore does not warrant further discussion. I'll sit down. Uh, treatment for hepatitis C genotype 3 and cirrhosis is unlikely to be successful with current medications, or this patient would benefit from antiviral therapy. And I expect to get a higher voting rate than Dr. Rockstro. Okay. Let's see. Hope everybody downloaded the app in the meantime. <laughs> okay. <We're laughs> Good. So uh, genotype 3 is uncommon. Only a few people, one, one person in the audience. Good. Uh, a third of the people felt that treatment response was unlikely to be successful with the current medications, and that... Uh, the majority thought that treating hepatitis C might benefit uh, this individual. So let's look at some of the data that may help us answer, uh, answer that question. Well, first, the question how common is hepatitis C genotype sometimes gets overlooked, particularly uh, us in the United States. But when you look at the global distribution of hepatitis C, it's true that genotype 1 predominates, shown there in red, uh, and genotype 3 is shown in green. But there are clearly pockets uh, around the world where genotype 3 is much more common and certainly is the, the most common genotype creating uh, sig substantial morbidity and mortality associated with that. So if we, if we look from a U.S. perspective or sometimes from a, a European perspective, we might underestimate the impact of genotype 3 globally. And then if we look at genotype 3 around the world and what the prevalence is in the various places, you'll see here that uh, the dark green represents the highest prevalences of hepatitis C genotype 3. And you'll see some uh, parts of South America, uh, Asia, uh, and uh, India, Pakistan, where you see a lot of genotype 3 as uh, representative of, uh, of the most common genotypes that we see here. In the U.S., uh, we see it's roughly about 1 to 10, uh, about maybe about 10% of what we see in general in the U.S., and you'll see in, uh, in Europe as well, somewhere between 10 and 25%. So we shouldn't underestimate the impact of hepatitis C genotype 3. We also recognize that genotype 3 has some unique features that have uh, been associated with this. We, you know, ironically, in the past with PEG interferon and ribavirin, we knew that we always used to group together genotype 2 and 3 in terms of response. We knew that genotype 3 
however, had a much higher relapse rate with interferon-based treatments in the past and historically lower rates of sustained virological response. Recently, some data has suggested that we see some accelerated fibrosis. You may see an increased incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, increased overall mortality, a slightly increased with genotype 3 compared to others. And overall, as I showed you, with the prevalence of hepatitis C, the burden of disease worldwide is the second most prevalent genotype. So therefore, we should have respect for genotype 3 and how we will approach it, because we'll clearly be seeing this more frequently in our practice and, and face some challenging treatment decisions. I will say the only, the, the, I, I know I, I re recognize the epidemiology associated with genotype 3. I'll just say that anecdotally in the U.S., we don't see a preponderance of genotype 3s on our transplant list or the mortality associated with genotype 3 specifically. So we have to reconcile some of the epidemiologic data with what we're seeing uh, in the clinic, at least uh, where we are. So what are, some of the what are some of the treatment options that we had? What would you potentially treat this individual with? And you can see a number of choices. Uh, we won't take into account the, the era that we were dealing with with that patient in 2013, but for now, what are some of the options that possibly would be good options for that patient? Sofosbuvir and ribavirin for 12 weeks, peg riba sofosbuvir for 12 weeks, soft riba for 24 weeks, decladosphere soft for 12, or decladosphere soft riba for 24. And there's probably not one best answer here. Maybe some that aren't ideal, but there's one, not one best answer yes, necessarily. Okay, so we have a, a number of options. Uh, the one that no one would choose, fortunately, is sofosbuvir and ribavirin for 12 weeks, and we'll examine the data about why that's clearly been demonstrated to be a suboptimal treatment, and then examine what other, uh, how these other treatment options may fit in for this patient. Well, if you recall from the sofosbuvir trials, when they studied genotype 2 and genotype 3, it was clear that sofosbuvir ribavirin 12 weeks was a fantastic treatment for genotype 2 with a few exceptions. But we noted early on that for genotype 3, we saw considerably decreased sustained virologic response rates compared to genotype 2 that were included in those studies. And you'll see this is a summary. You'll see highlighted in red on the far right column the sustained virologic response rates, which, you know, in the era of PEG interferon or ribavirin, we might have been satisfied with. But when we're dealing with 90-plus percent sustained virologic response rates with oral antiviral therapies for genotype 1, clearly, rates of 50 uh, and as low as 30 percent for, for genotype 3 cirrhotic treatment experience patients uh, would be unacceptable in this era. We got a glimpse that perhaps if we added PEG interferon to sofosbuvir and ribavirin, we can improve the sustained response rate from that uh, uh, small study, 24 patients that had a sustained virological response rate of 83 percent. So again, several years ago, this was kind of the landscape that we were thinking about. Well, additional data was developed to suggest that there are ways that we could improve treatment with sofosbuvir and ribavirin. Of course, one of them was extending out to 24 weeks from the valence study. And we'll see that when we went to 24 weeks, naive cirrhotic or non cirrhotic and even treatment experienced non cirrhotic patients had high rates of sustained response between 87 and 94 percent, and the regimen was extremely well tolerated. But we also see this drop off still in the cirrhotic treatment experience population where the best sustained virological response rate was only 60 percent. <clears throat> we learned from uh, some data from Professor Esteban that patients who had, been, who had relapsed to sofosbuvir and ribavirin therapies, a, a shorter course treatment, could be retreated with a longer course of sofosbuvir and ribavirin, or also PEG interferon could be added to this regimen for shorter duration and could improve the sustained virological response rate. So as you see here, in patients who, uh, in the absence of cirrhosis, they have, if they were treated with PEG, riba, and sofosbuvir for 12 weeks, they had a 93% sustained response rate, or 74% with sofosbuvir and ribavirin for 24 weeks. And if they were already cirrhotic, their SVR rates are 88% in the PEG plus ribosofosbuvir for 12 uh, weeks, or 47% with sofosbuvir and ribavirin when extended out to 24 weeks. So a clue, again, that adding the PEG may be beneficial in this circumstance. And even extending the duration in a retreatment situation may not be sufficient for the patient with cirrhosis. <clears throat> well, we had the opportunity, uh, Dave Nelson uh, mentioned about the uh, HCV target study in the observational cohort, and we had the opportunity in 2013, 2014 to look to see 
what was happening with the genotype 3 patients in that longitudinal observational study. We had 172 patients who were treated with cefospivir and ribavirin, and you'll see very few actually were treated with PEGSOF ribavirin. You see most of them were treatment experienced, most of them were cirrhotic, so a difficult group of patients to treat, similar to our gentleman. And both these regimens were, were very well tolerated. Sustained virological response rates here in the small group of patients with soft PEG riba, 89% with a, only a 6% relapse rate. Soft riba, uh, which was administered mostly for 24 weeks, had a 62% uh, sustained virological response rate. And when you looked at some of the subgroups, it was very consistent with what we had seen in some of the other uh, studies. Uh, the cirrhotic, if you just look at the right side of the graph there, you see the cirrhotic treatment experience population, only a 43% sustained virological response rate, treated with cefospivir and ribavirin for 24 weeks, or cirrhotic treatment naive patients up to 60% SVR. So we have some work to do in that population. <clears throat> well, recently, additional data has been developed by uh, Graham Foster, and he presented some of this earlier. This was the, the Boson study. And if we just focus on the genotype 3 patients that were treatment naive or treatment experienced with or without cirrhosis, uh, and we look at what those sustained virological response rates were in three arms of this study, cefospivir peg riba for 12 weeks, cefospivir and ribavirin for 24 weeks, or cefospivir and ribavirin for up to 16 weeks, we see that the group that received soft fosfivir peg riba had a highest sustained viral, the highest sustained virological response rate of 93% whereas the soft riba group had 71% for the shorter duration and up to 84% in the group that was treated for up to 24 weeks uh, with that regimen. Again, the, the regimens were both all well tolerated. Looking specifically at the treatment experienced cirrhotic population on the right side of the slide, we see that if they received cefospivir and ribavirin for 16 weeks, SVR rates were 47%. 24 weeks of soft riba, up to 77%, and with the addition of PEG, for, 24, for 12 weeks, so a shortened duration of soft riba with the addition of PEG, 86% uh, sustained virological response rate. Fairly encouraging for a difficult to treat patient population. So boiling all this information down uh, to, uh, to some treatment recommendations, uh, all of you are familiar with the AASLD IDSA guidelines and of course the counterpart of the EASL guidelines. This is just a, a snapshot of uh, boiling down all that information uh, that looks at specifically genotype 3. And in the era that we're talking about, shown there in the dark blue middle column, we had the availability of cefospivir and ribavirin. And this patient, shown in red, the red letters there, was a peg riba failure who already had cirrhosis. And you can see where that sort of led us to try, back in 2013, the treatment options that you see here, 12 weeks of peg interferon and ribavirin. And I'm going to come back of course, to the decladosphere and cefospivir story shortly. So this patient was started on PEG and ribavirin for 12 weeks. By week four, he complained of, again, as you might expect, severe fatigue, mood disorder, irritability. And we had discussed this with him before, but he really wanted to try something that would give him the best option. It was substantially affecting his life uh, without treatment. Platelet count had decreased, but his HCV RNA was having a very good response at that time. So what would be some of our options to manage this patient now? Decrease the PEG and ribavirin dose. Discontinue PEG and ribavirin and complete the 12 weeks of cefospivir and ribavirin. Discontinue PEG and continue treatment with soft riba for a total of 24 weeks. Or discontinue PEG riba and add the cladosphere. I didn't say these were going to be easy questions. Okay. All right. So people are still voting. Good. Okay, interesting. So <clears throat> some would decrease the PEG interferon and ribavirin dose, and that's certainly very reasonable to, to try to do and try to uh, uh, minimize those, those side effects. Discontinue PEG riba uh, and continue treatment for a full 12-week course. Uh, some patients thought that might be reasonable. I'll just mention that we looked at data that suggested 12 weeks was suboptimal in that group, and we were concerned about a truncated 12-week course of therapy in someone who was in the midst of therapy and maybe would benefit from a longer course of treatment. Uh, discontinue peg riba and continue for 24 weeks. Some people thought that. And then discontinue peg riba and add the cladosphere. Interesting thought. Of course, we didn't have the cladosphere available uh, at that time. 
And the data from the cladosphere has only more recently become available. And you see, of course, the Ally 3 study uh, that uh, treated patients who were either treatment naive. You'll see about 20% with cirrhosis or prior treatment experienced, 25% of those patients who had cirrhosis. And they were treated with the cladosphere and sofosbuvir for 12 weeks. And you'll see the sustained virological response rates were quite excellent, 90% and 86%. Overall, about 20% of those patients had cirrhosis. Seven of those patients had uh, prior cefospivir uh, failures. But when you honed in on a group that was more relevant to the patient in question, the one who had cirrhosis, you'll see that the relapse occurred almost exclusively in those patients who were cirrhotic. And if you broke down the sustained virologic response rates between milder forms of fibrosis, F0 to F3, 96% SVR rate, but 63% SVR in patients who already had advanced fibrosis, suggesting that, yes, this regimen worked really well in the non-cirrhotic population of a short duration, but still we had a way to go to optimize treatment in the cirrhotic, particularly treatment experience group. So what are some of the data that's now being developed to try to optimize the genotype 3 study. Well, the Ally 3 Plus study uh, is looking at a, a longer course of, uh, well, 12 weeks of decladosphere and sofosbuvir with ribavirin, or extending that treatment to 16 weeks in, in addition to ribavirin as well, to see if we can optimize that group in a patients with advanced fibrosis who are treatment naive or treatment experienced. And uh, we expect that that data will be presented at AASLD, and we're looking forward to seeing that. But over time, there's been a lot of data developed uh, from the European cohorts from various compassionate use or expanded access protocols. And you'll see here, uh, this is the, um, the French expanded access uh, uh, protocol that took patients with, um, who were treated with cefospivir and ribavirin genotype 3 in patients with cirrhosis. This is an interim analysis. You'll see that most patients had advanced fibrosis. The treatment choice was at the discretion of the physician. And you'll see that they could get either decladosphere or sofosbuvir with or without ribavirin for either 12 or 24 weeks. The majority chose 24 weeks of decladosphere or sofosbuvir with ribavirin. And if we look at the sustained virological response rates, we see it in the cirrhotic population of those who received 24 weeks of decladosphere plus sofosbuvir. And again, most of those got ribavirin, although I don't know if I've seen the exact breakout uh, of which or without, you'll see that 88% of those had a sustained virological response compared to 76% of those who only got 12 weeks of treatment. And the non serotic population, of course, did slightly better, but still uh, overall higher rates of response with the cladosphere or We also see from uh, the English expanded access protocol that uh, Graham Foster has presented previously, they had the option of using different NS5A inhibitors, either decladosphere or ledipasphere, with or without ribavirin for only 12 weeks. And here, again, in an interim analysis, we see the genotype, these were genotype 3 patients. Uh, most of them had advanced cirrhosis with a median MELD score of about 13. And you'll see that with the sofosbuvir decladosphere treatment, with or without ribavirin, 70, 71% sustained virological response rate compared to uh, 60, 43 percent in those who were treated with sofosbuvir and ledipasphir. And then finally, uh, from data that uh, Tanya Welsell had presented uh, earlier at EASL and also at this meeting, we see a 24-week regimen of decladosphere and sofosbuvir with or without ribavirin in a compassionate use program and sustained virological response rates. If we just look at the third grouping of bars from the right, we see SVR rates ranging between 85 uh, and 100 percent uh, in patients who were treated with decladosphere, sofosbuvir, with or without ribavirin. So suggesting that now we have potentially other treatment options. And indeed, if we look at the AASLD IDSA recommendations, this has now, of course, been incorporated as a possible treatment for genotype 3. And I'll just call your attention to hcvguidelines.org. And similarly, with the easel recommendations from 2015, uh, and actually, that's, these are the easel recommendations here. You'll see that uh, they've also uh, embraced the uh, addition of uh, decladosphere to sofosbuvir for genotype 3, particularly those with advanced fibrosis, as shown in the bottom half of the slide there. Uh, and you'll see they recommend the addition of ribavirin for 24 weeks or treating PEG plus ribavirin and sofosbuvir uh, for 12 weeks. So genotype 3 represents a huge global disease burden. The natural history and treatment response uh, is unique. Uh, current therapies are highly effective for these non cirrhotic patients. And patients with genotype 3 and cirrhosis are doing much better than they were in the past. 
but we, they still have lower SVR rates, and, and of course, novel approaches are, are required. And I think all of us want to know how our patients did. Well, we actually opted to stop the PEG, uh, continue them on soft riba for a full 24 weeks, and he did achieve sustained virologic response, and he's an extremely happy individual now who's retired, boating, fishing, playing golf, and leading a, a very happy life. So uh, a pleasant outcome, and I hope we'll have many more of those in genotype 3 with advanced fibrosis. So thank you very much. So we'll certainly open Mike's uh, discussion up for questions and comments. So Mike, do you think the peg interferon did anything other than make him feel bad? It, it's hard to know. I mean, we, we still know that uh, with sophosphate and ribavirin alone, his a priori sustained virological response was only about 60%. So by adding the PEG, I think we had the opportunity to increase that and shorten the overall duration of treatment. But once he clearly wasn't going to tolerate it, and again, we had discussed with him, you're probably going to have the exact same you know, side effects with PEG uh, the next time around. We he wanted to try it. Again, the, the landscape was that was all we had available at the time. And uh, it, it, it certainly drove his virus down quite dramatically in the addition of the phosphor So. Uh, who knows, but it was a good, good outcome. Yep. Any questions for Mike from the audience? So Michael, what would you have done if the patient would have been a relapser? I mean, then he had received uh, PEC riba, interferon alpha ribavine, sofosbuvir PEC ribavine. Yeah. Um, is it getting very difficult then, or is it just a question of time because next year we will get new drugs and then everything is easy. So right. what, what is your well, estimate? I don't think it'll ever be easy, but yeah. The, um, I think he still would have had the option uh, now, of course, of trying sofosbuvir decladosphere with ribavirin, potentially for 24 weeks. And although we haven't talked about some of the newer agents coming down the road, of course, uh, uh, 5816 potentially could have uh, benefit in that population as well. So I think we would have had some other options in our armamentarium in the, in the near future. He was still fairly well compensated, although he did have some evidence of, of portal hypertension, so I think he would have done okay. But fortunately, we didn't have to worry about it in this individual. But there clearly are going to be other options, and I think those immediate ones would, would be probably beneficial for him. Yeah. But before you sit down, I'll ask you about a patient I'll actually see next week. Uh, she took soft peg riba. So peg ribavirin failure took soft peg ribavirin, responded, relapsed. Mm. Uh, evidence of cirrhosis by fibro scan, although clinically quite well and uh, synthetic function intact, so very stable with perhaps early cirrhosis by elastography, but has already failed peg soft ribavirin in 12 weeks. Right. So that's where I think that the person has not seen an NS5A inhibitor. So I think it's quite possible to think about retreating that individual with soft decladosphere plus ribavirin for 24 weeks would be an option. Alternatively, waiting to see the final data from the uh, you know, advanced fibrosis cohorts with uh, uh, agents such as uh, the, the um, uh, NS5816 uh, and see what would happen with that. So I think you will have some additional options just like if this guy has relapsed. So you're, you're, well, you haven't made a decision yet. Well, we're, we're, but, so the, yeah. the option we have through clinical practice, potentially if her uh, insurance company were to agree to cover the cost of 24 weeks of decladosphere plus sofosphere plus ribavirin, yeah. that's certainly an option we would, we're considering. The other option may be to enroll in a clinical trial uh, using a genotype 3 active protease inhibitor plus a genotype 3 active NS5A uh, plus a nuke. And the question is whether that uh, whether the issue with three is that it's really so difficult or just that we haven't had drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it, we're seeing, of course, those drugs now starting to demonstrate ext extremely good EC50s against genotype 3. So I suspect the ones you're talking about will be very effective, uh, more so than some of the ones that are more pan, le or I should say less pan genotypic. Yeah. Uh, the issue that Mark raises about access, of course, is, is a big one. And uh, decladosphere in the U.S. has just recently been approved trying to uh, get that through our uh, payer system. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience yet with that. We're just starting to see that hit. I don't know what other, if you've had any problems with that yet, Mark. Well, well certainly it's, uh, it, it, the regimen is just now getting started to be used yeah. in the United States. We were, we just got approval a few weeks ago uh, mm -hmm. for the use of it. So we'll, we'll see how, what her insurance company says and see what trial options there may be. So if there are no 
Additional questions? We let you go. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you.